Well, good morning, Faith Community Church. Hello to our church family here in Willerton and our church family joining us in City Campus as well as the online campus. Now, we're five weeks into this series called Walk the Talk, where we unpack the Apostle James's letter one passage at a time. At this point, I hope you're beginning to get a sense of the letter, what it feels like, and also the author of the letter. Now, if you're joining us new and fresh and you have no clue, well, James, the person, the author of this letter, he sounds a lot like that well-meaning but straightforward uncle that comes for dinner every now and then and then says things that makes you go like, what? Uh, he will say things like, you know, Dan, you, you, you can't just keep playing games. You have to study harder. Study hard. Dan, you, you look like you've put on weight, like you're getting a little bit rounder around the stomach. You got to eat less. You got to exercise more. Dan, you only have one child. When are you going to have another one? <laughs> not very comfortable conversations. But here's what I discovered. The book of James is not an easy one to read or to preach, but it can, it can be quite confronting. But if you really want to live for Jesus, then you have to read the book of James. As the great Christian author A.W. Tozer, he said about the book of James, the book of James serves as a mirror reflecting our true faith or the true state of our faith and challenging us to live authentically for Christ. That's what we're doing today. So may God's, work speak, may God's word speak to us today and challenge us to live faith, our faith authentically for Christ. Someone say amen. Say to the person next to you, May God speak to you. Amen. Let's believe it. So going into James chapter 2, verse 14 to 26, here we go. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good, even demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Spirit, would you come and illuminate the words of God in our hearts and tell us what to do with it. Speak to us individually that we may hear your voice for ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You know, if our passage today that I've just read, if it sounds intense, and that's because James is getting intense. He's intending to be intense. Now, James has covered at this point enduring trials, overcoming temptations, obeying God's word, avoiding favoritism, and now he's on to a very high stakes topic and arguably the very heart of the entire letter itself, and that is the life and the death of our faith. In this passage, James is warning us against having a kind of faith that will shipwreck our, our walk with God, and instead he instructs us to have faith that works. Both faith that actually works and faith that produces works. And James does that through three parts, which I will introduce to us today. But I gotta warn you, it starts off really negative, really negative, but it, it, it ends off on a positive. So go on a journey with me, okay? Don't walk out of this service halfway, okay? I promise you, it'll get good. The first part is this. He tells us about a dead faith. 
a dead faith. In James 2.14, he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Throughout this passage, James repeatedly talks about deeds, actions, works. What are they? They are all the same Greek word, which is agon. And it means the same thing. Basically, it's something you do. Not just something you see or something you talk about, something inside, but something that you do on the outside. And I want you to notice in here, James didn't say, what good is it if people have faith without deeds? Rather, he says, what good is it if people claim to have faith but no deeds? In other words, it's not just faith without deeds that is the problem here. It's the kind of faith that claims, I don't need to do anything about my faith. That is the problem. So church, if you're hearing this this morning and you're thinking, oh dear, oh dear, Pastor Dan, I haven't done anything about my faith, you're still okay. But if you're thinking to yourself, I haven't done anything about my faith and I don't intend to, I don't need to, then brothers and sisters, that is not okay. James questions that. He says, can, for people like that, for people with such kind of faith, can such faith save them? And he brings an analogy, he brings in an analogy to take home this point. And he says, now suppose a brother or a sister without clothes and daily food. Now notice here that James is not raising a faraway case. It's an impossible hypothetical case. He's raising a very probable and very personal example. Now if James was alive today, James might put it to us this way. Now if someone that you know in church if someone that you know in church, and he goes on to say, is without clothes and daily food. Now, this person is said to be lacking two things. Adequate clothes. Some of you woke up this morning and you came to church not realizing how cold it is, and now you're freezing. You're lacking adequate clothes. Now, this is, this is more than that. Someone who actually doesn't have enough clothes to survive. And the second thing that this person lacks is daily food. The person constantly is hungry. So we're talking about the basic necessities for survival here. And James says, if, well, if any one of you says to a brother like that or a sister like that, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Now, James is pointing out a problematic response from a Christian with a problematic faith. How do we know that? Now look at what this particular Christian says. Go in peace. This is a typical Jewish greeting. Shalom, shalom. Peace, peace. It is the, day, is the, is the modern equivalent of how are you? Some of you, you asked that. You said that today when you greeted one another or you responded to one another. How are you? Or in Australia, we say, good day, mate. That's how we say it over here. It's go in peace. How are you? And then he goes on to say, keep warm. Now, why does this person say that? Because the person, the brother and sister, obviously does not have enough clothes. And then this Christian goes on, and be well fed. Why does he say that? Because this person obviously doesn't have enough food to eat. So that's the first part of the problem. Notice it's not that this Christian with a problematic faith is ignorant to the needs of the brothers and sisters. This Christian knows exactly what this brother or sister in need needs. And that's the first problem. The second problem is this. Notice it's not what this Christian actually says that is the problem for James. There, there's nothing wrong with blessing one another. Go in peace, go, be well fed, um, you know, stay warm. So, so please don't stop blessing one another, okay? So, so continue to bless one another. God bless you, you know, God loves you, you know, uh, go in peace. Don't, say, don't stop saying that. But there is something very wrong if that is where we stop. If that's all we do and say, bless you, bless you. God is, James is telling us that this Christian knows exactly what the brother or sister needs, but does nothing to meet it. And James is questioning, what good is that? What good is it if it's all talk and no action? Brothers and sisters, we know, if we know a brother or sister who has a need, do something about it. That's what it means. So if you know a brother or sister who's lacking supplies at home, 
Instead of just saying, the Lord bless you, how about we say, let me bless you? If someone today that you're going to go out for lunch with doesn't have enough money for the meal, instead of saying, let me pray for you, how about we say, let me pay for you? Some of, some of us can start practicing that for lunch right after this. Put this to action. Now, if someone comes up to you and say they need someone to talk to, instead of thinking about calling the pastor, hey, pastor, brother or sister has a problem, why don't we call upon the Holy Spirit and we talk to them? Instead of, and if we know someone who's grieving the loss of a loved one, instead of just praying with them, why don't we consider staying with them? Because no one who's lost a loved one should come home to an empty house on the very first night of that loss. So why don't we consider staying with that person, being with that person? You see, a Christian who walks the talk is a Christian who does something. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to do everything, but it does mean that we cannot do nothing. Amen. If you understand, say amen. Amen. And if our Christian faith is genuine, it will show in our actions. But if we have no actions to show for, then our faith is as good as dead. That's what James is saying. And let me bring it home for you and me. Brothers and sisters, now if you didn't tell anyone that you were a Christian, would they know that you were a follower of Jesus Christ? Would they know if you didn't tell them? Will your classmates know that you are a Christian? from your behavior in school? Well, your neighbors, can your neighbors tell that you're a Christian from the way that you live? Can your colleagues at work know that you're a Christian from how you conduct yourself in the workplace? Have a think about that. How are we going when it comes to showing our faith and doing something for other people or doing something so people will know that we are Christians? It's a challenging message. It's a confronting one, but it is also a much needed one. Because this is the Bible's definition of a dead faith. It says in verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. So that's the first thing that James tells us about a dead faith. And the second thing that he teaches us is about dangerous faith, a dangerous faith. Now, up until this point, James is addressing the whole church, brothers and sisters, he starts by that. And now he turns to an imaginary opponent and he begins to argue with his opponent. Have you ever done that to yourself? Have you ever argued with yourself? Yeah. Uh, I wonder if this packet of chips from Woolies is better than that packet of chips from Woolies. Well, what do I think? Uh, I, I like the flavor, but this one is on half price. I think I'll get this one because it makes more sense. Uh, I, I wonder if, if I feel like eating that lunch on the menu or do, should I really fast and go for a, a, a cup of fruit juice? You begin to argue with yourself. Why do you argue? Why do we argue with ourselves sometimes? And that's to reason. We're trying to figure out, okay, what should we do? That's, what, that's exactly what James is doing here. He's reasoning with this person to show us two dangers to our faith. He says in verse 18, but someone, this someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Now this person is responding to James, what he said earlier, and he's saying, he's claiming, faith is faith and works is works. They are two separate things. And such thinking, James says, leads us to two kinds of dangers. The first danger is this, thinking that doing is everything. Someone in danger of that just focuses on a doing, 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 doing things for God, doing things for other people, doing things for my friends, doing things for myself, busy just doing, doing, doing. Now this person maybe, maybe in the morning will rush to read the Bible. I must open my Bible, I must read the book of James, and then after that I must read from chapter one to chapter five, I must finish it in five minutes. And then after that, they will rush to get out of the house. Come on kids, let's get out of the house. We gotta make it to church on time. Pastor Dan is preaching today. We don't wanna miss his preaching. 8.30, we gotta make it there. Come on, get out of the house. And then they'll rush to church. They'll drive at 70, 70 kilometers per hour on a 50 kilometer road, woo, 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 woo. and then finally when they reach the church and they, they cannot wait to park and they, they're waiting for this car in front of them and they're rushing to get into the car park. They're like, bro, can you please hurry up? I need to get to church. Bro, bro, it's actually very easy to park. You just have to do it one time. Why you go three times? Bro, 
they're rushing to get into the church. And then when they're finally in church, they're rushing to get into worship. I cannot wait to worship God. Come on, Pastor Dave, sing a bit faster. I want to sing five songs instead of four. I want to rush to worship. And at the end of the sermon, they rush to the front for the altar call. Pastor Dan, I want to be prayed for. Uh, I want to be prayed for for five days. Come on, Pastor Dan, pray for one, two, three, four, five. And then after that, they rush up for lunch. And they say, I want to eat something. I'm very hungry now. And then they rush home. And finally, I'm done for church. Rush, rush, rush. And some of us are in genuine danger of that. I know I am. Even as I was preparing for this message, it was just rush, 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 doing, 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 doing. Now, no wonder, no wonder some of us feel so tired and worn out. You know, talking about all that rush, rush, rush already makes me tired. I don't know about you hearing it. So brothers and sisters, how about we come back to focusing on being with Jesus? And as Jesus says in Luke 10, verse 42, he says, choose that one thing that is really needed, and that is to be with him at his feet. If you're rushing, 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 doing, 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 then maybe you have adopted this thinking that doing is everything. How about we center in on the Lord and take our faith, by be, take our faith seriously by being with Him? American Christian author Richard Raw, I love what he says here. He says, we are called to be hum- not to be human doings, but human beings. Tell the person next to you, you're not a human doing. You're a human being. So all doing and no being with Jesus, which means tending to our faith, leads to a dead, useless faith. James uses that word, useless faith, later on. So that's the first danger. Thinking that doing is everything. The second danger is this. Thinking that faith is everything. My inner faith is everything. Someone in danger of that just focuses on what's inside. And they will say things like, I love God a lot, I love God a lot, but it's all in my heart. I worship God a lot, look at me, I worship God, but it's all in my mind. I serve God a lot, yes, I do serve Him a lot, but it's all within my soul. I'm super on fire for God, I'm super on fire, but my passion is all inside. It's all inside. The church, we know, we laugh because we know that's a false distinction, right? I love God, I serve God, I worship you, I adore God, I'm passionate about God, but it's all inside. Now, you don't believe me, you try saying that to your partner tonight and see what happens. I love you, honey, I love you so much, but it's all in my heart. I adore you, you are the most important thing in my life, and and everything that I do is all around you, but it's all in my mind. I'm super passionate for you. You're my one and only. I love you so much. You're the love of my life, but it's all inside. You try saying that and see what happens. You sleep outside. (laughs) Yeah, then you sleep outside. Yeah, it's not all inside. Well, brothers and sisters, our passion needs proof. Our faith needs actions. What is outside must match what is inside. Amen. And James says in verse 18, that's why he says, show me your faith. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. Now the Greek word show is the word deknuo. Deknuo, which means give evidence to prove. In other words, James is challenging that person. I would like to see you prove your faith without doing anything. Let's see if you can prove your faith without actions. Let's see you try But James doesn't stop there. He goes on, he gives a killer blow. So he gives two hit combo, poo poo. And he gives one more killer blow. And he says in verse 19, you believe that there is one God? Good, because even demons believe that and shudder. Now, what does he mean here? James is referring to the core belief, the central belief of all Jews and all Jewish Christians that he's writing to at that time, which is the Shema found in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. And the Shema says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now this is the core belief of all Christians back then, of all the Jewish Christians and all the Jews. So what is James saying here? He's saying, you believe in God? You believe that there is one God? You believe in the Bible? Good for you. But so what? 
Even if you believe all that with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and you do nothing, your faith is no better than a demon's. You have a demon, congratulations, you have a demon level faith. You have a demonic faith. Turn to the person next to you. No, no, don't say that to them. <laughs> now, why? B- because demons know. He says, demons know and believe that Jesus is God too. They know that. But that doesn't make demons followers of Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, just because we believe in Jesus doesn't mean we have real faith. Real faith is always accompanied by action. Faith without action is dead and useless. Listen to what he says in the next verse, verse 20. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? So brothers and sisters, here's the point. Don't fall into the danger of focusing only on the doing. Maybe some of us are in danger of that today. And don't fall, don't fall into the danger of focusing only on the inner faith, it's all inside. Focus on both, because faith isn't just about what we know or what we believe, but also what we say and what we do. Amen. And then then he goes on to his third point. So he talked about the dead faith, he talks about the dangerous faith, and now he talks about how faith in action looks like. So he's talking about a doing faith. That's the third thing. And James gives us two examples of a doing faith. He is a man in the Bible named Abraham, And there's a woman in the Bible named Rahab. So let me talk about Abraham first because he started off with Abraham. So here's a quick backstory of Abraham. The whole story can be found in Genesis 15, chapter 15 to 22. You can read it at your own time. But basically, this is what happened. Abraham was promised by God to have a son. Now, he had no son at that point in time, right? He had no children. And God promised him that he will have one son whom the nation, a great nation, And many descendants are going to come out of that son. And eventually, this is the nation of Israel. So Abraham waited and waited. He waited 25 whole years before finally his son Isaac was born to him. And then everything was going fine and dandy. It was a bed of roses until one day God showed up and God said to him in Genesis 22 verse 2. And God said this, Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go into the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. In other words, he's saying, Abraham, I want you to kill your son. And some of you are like, what? And Abraham, I mean, Abraham had every reason to say, but God, this doesn't make sense. You promised me I will have my son. You promised me this son will lead to a great nation, will have many people. I waited 25 minutes for this promised son, and now you're telling me to kill my son? This does not make sense. Are you kidding me, God? And despite it not making any sense, he didn't think any of those things. He didn't do any of those things. He simply obeyed God and did what God said to the T. And as he raised his knife and his son was on the altar and he was about to bring that knife down, in the very last moment, God stopped him. Plot twist, right? God stopped him and God said to him in verse 12, do not lay your hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld me from me, your son, your only son. Now, this particular episode of Abraham acting in faith is the occasion for what James is going to say next in verse 21 to 22. So coming back to James, chapter 2. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, we had already unpacked how faith and works are inseparable, right? We already talked about it, so I'm not going to rehash that. I just want to bring out one thing, one highlight, one thing about Abraham's faith that is mentioned here. The Bible says, his faith was made complete by what he did. The Greek word for made complete is the word teleo, which also means, which also translates made perfect. His faith was made perfect. What does that teach us? It teaches us this, that faith without works is an unperfected faith. Faith with works is a perfected faith. 
Let me bring, let me, let me, sh- let me tell you, sh- share with you an analogy to let you know what it looks like. You know what it looks like? It, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a bride's hair on her wedding day. Have you ever noticed that every bride on their wedding day has perfectly set hair when they walk down the aisle? And they look so beautiful and their hair is nicely shaped. It's almost like if the wind blew right through, it wouldn't even move. It's so perfectly and so beautifully set. But despite all that flowy perfection in in, in that moment when she's walking down the aisle, I guarantee you this, that her hair looked nothing like that in the morning when she woke up. How many of us know that? That is so true. And I, in fact, I'll tell you a secret. Her hair probably looked more like a frizzy fuzzball from a sleepless night of tossing and turning because she cannot sleep. Sorry to dash all, the, all your dreams, our brothers. If you think that you're going to wake up to a girl with perfectly set hair and wonderful makeup every morning, that's not going to happen, all right? That's Hollywood. Real life is very different. Now, here's my point. Before a bride works on her hair is a complete mess. When she woke up in the morning, it's a mess. But with some work, it is made perfect. It's the same with our faith. We may have faith today. You may have faith today, but without works, our faith remains unperfected. It's still a messy morning. But with works, our faith is made perfect. So for those of us who have hair, and those of us who came to church today, and your hair is beautiful and it's perfect, that's because you worked on it. And I thought a little bit more and I realized, unfortunately, this analogy breaks down for those of us who have no hair. So I'm so sorry. You just have to figure it out what that means for yourself. Well, church, because Abraham acted on faith, his faith was made perfect. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 23 to 24, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So brothers and sisters, as the adage goes, as the old saying goes, action speaks louder than words. You know, notice two times in this passage, James tells us to see. You see, you see, verse 22 and verse 24. You see, you see. Why is he able to tell us to see? That's because Abraham Abraham acted on his faith. Real faith can be seen. Brothers and sisters, it is by our actions that people will see our faith. You know, the singer Elvis Presley was very right when he suggested a little less conversation, a little more action. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay. Elvis Presley said that. But church, let let our faith be seen in our actions and not just in our conversations. Seen in our works and not just in our words. Seen in our deeds and not just in our creeds. Seen in our obedience and not just in our opinions. Amen. Let it be seen. Let our faith be worked out. So that's Abraham. Number two. James brings in the second example of doing faith, Rahab. And he says in verse 25, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. So once again, here's the quick backstory on Rahab. The full story is found in Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 6. So go home and read it at your own time if you want. But here's what happened. Joshua, the new commander of the Israelites, sent two spies into the city of Jericho to kind of suss out the land to see how easy it is to conquer and how best they can conquer it, what the people in Jericho was going to be like. And Rahab, this prostitute who was living near the city walls, she met them and she knew who they were. But because she believed in the God of Israel, she housed these two spies in her house. She hid them. And when the king of Jericho, who heard about these spies, sent soldiers to come and find the spies in her house, she said, oh, they went that way. She sent the the soldiers to one direction while she sent the spies to safety in the opposite direction. That's what it means. And like Abraham, I just want to highlight one aspect of Rahab's faith, and that is this. Rahab had everything going against her as a model of faith. Did you realize that? She's not like Abraham. Many of us now say, Father Abraham, he's a father of faith. 
Father Abraham, look at him. He's a wonderful model and example of faith. But Rahab had nothing going for her when it comes to becoming a model of faith. What do I mean by that? You see, she's a woman, number one. A man in those days is highly, highly esteemed. It's a status. A woman, however, means nothing. It's worth nothing in that kind of a society at a time. For a woman to be worth something, she has to be married so that her worth is now in the man. So she's a woman. Number two, she's a Canaanite. She's not even an Israelite, which means to say, if this was the people of God, the chosen people of God, she would be somewhere here. She's not a person that belongs to the family of God, number two. And number three, from a moral standpoint, from a vocation standpoint, she's a prostitute. Abraham is kind of like the president of his clan, but Rahab is like the prostitute of the land. That's what it means. And unlike Abraham, Rahab didn't have any supernatural encounters with God. It's not like God showed up and said, Rahab, Rahab, let me talk to you. He didn't give her any promise. But here's what I learned from Rahab's example in this story. I learned that it matters not how you came to faith, but it matters to God how you live out your faith. You may have come to church for all the wrong reasons. I came to church for the boys. I came to church for the girls. You might have stumbled into the faith because you were addicted to some substance and someone said, maybe you can find your freedom in church. You might have come to church really broken because you are, you are suffering from anxiety and depression. And that's why you choose to come and try to find some solution. You may have came to church or come back to church because you're, you have a broken family now. Your spouse is separated from you. Your kids are estranged from you. You no longer get to see them and you're hoping to find some peace and solace in church. It doesn't matter how you came to church, but it matters how you live your faith from now on. You see, Rahab wasn't born into a quality family. She wasn't, but she had a quality faith. She chose to fear God and she chose to act on her faith. And because of that, God considered her faith proven. The rubber stamp of God's approval on your faith you are genuine, you are valid, you are legitimized. And he honored her with the highest honor. How do we see that? Number one, Rahab's story is forever enshrined in the Bible, God's holy word in Joshua 2 and Joshua 6. Number two, Rahab, you know that great chapter of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11? Rahab is the only woman, the only woman found in the list of great heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. And later on in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, we read that Rahab even became an ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? Through the, through the body, through the broken body of Rahab, our Lord Jesus was eventually born. You too, brothers and sisters, you can start and choose to act on your faith beginning from today. And James finally ends off in verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So church, God desires for us to have an authentic faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. A living, breathing faith that is proven again and again and again by our actions. How many of us want that? Say amen. Amen. But the big question is, how do we have a faith like that? Pastor Dan, how do I live out a faith like that? I want to give us very quickly three key applications to act on your faith. Number one, they start with A-C-T, act on, act. A stands for attend to others' needs. In verse 16, James says this, if any one of you says to a brother in need, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? This teaches us that we shouldn't just talk. It means don't just talk, attend to the needs of others in a tangible way. Some of us might know, but Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, he taught about how we should all be the salt and the light of the earth. He said all his disciples need to be the salt and the light of the earth. But did you realize at the end of that part when Jesus was teaching about that, what did he, how did he describe the effects of the salt and the light of the earth? Let's read in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made saltier again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 
You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Church, did you catch that? Jesus didn't say, you are the soul of the earth and the light of the world that others may be moved by your good heart. That others may be convinced by your good preaching and your good teaching. That others may be impressed by your good Bible knowledge. No, brothers and sisters, Jesus said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And then they'll glorify your Father who is in heaven. And as John Wesley, the great founder of the Methodist Church, he said this, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. So church, is there anyone around you today who is in need that you know? Is there anyone? What are you doing about it? Number one, attend to the needs of others. Number two, carry out God's words. The Bible says in James 2.21, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? This means don't just know God's word because Abraham knew what God said to him. He knew that God wanted him to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, but he didn't just know God's word. He carried it out. So we need to carry out God's words. That's what he means. Jesus said this in John 8.32, he said this to the people who are listening to him. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Some of us are so familiar with this verse. We say amen to that. Some of us understand this verse to tell us the importance of knowing God's truth that will set us free. But did you notice the verse starts with then? The word then. You know what this means? This means that this happened, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Will happen only when something happens before that. Something happens, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What is that something? Let's turn to verse 31 to see it in its context. Jesus says this, to the Jews who had believed in him. Now these were Jews who already believed in Jesus. Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Meaning, these people already believe in Jesus, but Jesus says, not enough, guys. You believe in me, not enough. If you hold on to my teaching, if you observe my teaching, if you carry out and obey my teaching, then you will, be re you will really be my disciples. Believing is not enough. Doing and obeying God's word will lead you to becoming disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what it means for us. So don't miss this. Real disciples of Christ are those who don't just know or believe in Him, but also carry out His words. So C, carry out the words of God. Finally, T, take next steps of faith. In verse 25 of James chapter 2 about Rahab, James says this, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. What does this mean? This means don't just stop at believing in Jesus. So many of us in this room today are Christians. Don't just stop there. Keep taking next steps of faith again and again. You see, before Rahab met Israel's spies, she was already a believer of God. The Bible doesn't say and explain how, but it goes straight into the, the fact that she believed in God. But just because she believed in God, she didn't stop there. She kept doing and doing and doing it. The first thing she did, the first step she did was that she housed the spies. And then she took the next step and she hid the spies. And then she took another step and she sent the soldiers a different way. She helped the spies. And finally, she took another step and she tied a scarlet cord on her window so that they could identify that she had helped them. So what does this mean for us? Church, it means don't stop moving in faith. You've taken one step of faith. You've gotten baptized. Praise the Lord. You got them connected to a connect group. Praise the Lord. You've come to know Jesus. Praise the Lord. You've done that course. Amazing. We celebrate that. Now, how about taking one more? 
So church, is there a step of faith that God is wanting you to take, to act on? And how about you act on it today? How about you start thinking and praying about that today? So brothers and sisters, I, I leave all of us with, with these three applications to act on, ACT. Attend to others' needs, carry out God's words, and take next steps of faith. Someone say amen. Would you stand with me? Let me pray, and then we'll respond to God's words today. Let me pray and then I'll let you know what we're going to do. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we've heard your voice. We've heard your words. We've unpacked that. It's confronted us. It has challenged us. Now, Lord, help us to commit to living a life of faith that is not only in words or in belief, but is carried out in action. And our hope and our desire is not only that we have an authentic faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, but as Jesus says, that all people may see our good deeds and ultimately bring you glory, our Father in heaven. So help us as we continue to press in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.